Unfortunately, Simon is still on the other side of the Atlantic as he was not able to hit his flight. So uh, um, hence we got Brett, who's going to be filling in. Um, first of all, guys, before we go into going into what is a digital bank, what is a digitized bank, how we can actually do that, I just want to know a little bit about what you look after on a day-to-day, -day, who you are. So, uh, Alice, first of all, who, who are you? Uh, who am I? I'm sure almost none of you ever heard about my French bank since we're very new, very little. Uh, so, we are the new digital bank of La Banque Postale that was launched last July. There are already 100,000 customers, uh, mainly under 38, um, mainly using their mobiles, of course. So, what are we? We are day-to-day -day mobile bank providing a current, a real-time current account with a few services to manage uh, your daily financing easily, uh, with services such as instant loan, uh, smart saving, uh, new um, payment solutions, uh, and very innovative savings such as payment sharing with friends. Does, um, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit there. Does anyone in the audience from France by chance have a My French Bank account? Yes, yes to that gentleman over there. Great, yeah. great, welcome. Excellent, and uh, uh, Karine, who are you? <laughs> uh, Karine van Genep, comment dit en français, or van Genep in English, van Genep in Dutch. Uh, so I'm Dutch, um, I'm responsible for R&D in France, which uh, is R&D wholesale banking, so loans to big enterprise, and it's the old R&D Direct. Um, and I think R&D Direct, um, we could say it's one of the first fintechs um, because we started 20 years ago here in France and even longer ago in other countries um, with this focus on customer experience, with this focus on really doing what's best for the customer. And that's what we've been trying to do for the past 20 years here in France and in, in all the other countries. And today we call it ING because we are already direct. And we're a digital bank, which means we have no branches. Um, it's all digital. Of course, we have a call center as well, but uh, nothing physical. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Brett, and obviously you're here with m multiple hats on. Yeah, um, so I am the, the executive chair and founder of Movin, which was the first mobile challenger bank in the world. Um, we launched the very first account opening in, in, in a mobile app for the, you know, any, anywhere in the world. Um, we did the first contactless uh, technology where we had stickers that we stuck on the back of phones back in 2012 for contactless payments. This was prior to Google Pay and Apple Pay. Um, we got the first patent in financial wellness globally um, so we, we've done that we've got about a, a two and a half million users in North America right now but um, most of our business these days is license, licensing our technology to banks around the world so we've got about 10 million users overall on the platform in 15 different geographies but most of that traction is coming through partnerships with banks around the world such as uh, TD in uh, Canada, uh, Bank Central Asia and Tanaku in Indonesia, Cellcom in Tanzania, Yandex Money in Russia, um, Bank Atlantida in LATAM, etc. So we're helping banks go from banks to digital. Excellent. Right. I want to get into um, my background, weirdly, is, uh, is film production. You can see my name in the credit of the first Captain America film. Um, but when it comes to editing, in film, there's sort of two different types of software. There's Avid, if anyone's familiar with it, which is literally a virtual machine of uh, big cogs for spooling physical film. It is a virtual version of that. It's a digitized Steenbeck machine, which is kind of, kind of nuts. And then on the other side, you have Adobe Final Cut Windows Movie Maker, which is a truly digital video editing system. And there's a big difference between the two, um, between having simply a digitized process and something that's truly digital. Um, so with that in mind, I want to put to the panel, where do you see the difference between digital and digitized? And it's very easy to kind of write off digitized, but there's, there, is, there are moments you need kind of both. So what's your sort of viewpoint on digital versus digitized? Uh, if I go first, maybe I will take the example of La Banque Postale. Um, as we all know, customers have new expectations. They want services that are real-time, personalized, uh, insightful, and they, wa they want it with a very well-designed uh, experience. 
And La Banque Postale has to, to actually meet those expectations as any other bank. And the way they decided to do it is on a two-speed approach. First, invest heavily uh, in the transforming the core activities uh, which serve uh, its uh, 10 million customers uh, by digitizing the services and the processes and combining the strong physical presence of La Banque Postale through the post office network with new digital touch points. This is the first part of the project. And the second one was to create uh, a new greenfield activity, which is uh, what is uh, what was my what my French bank is about? Uh, it's a full digital model, very new, open uh, to partners, to new services, uh, in order to improve the experience we can deliver to customers. Um, we've got our own end-to-end uh, -end technology platform our own brand, we, our own product portfolio. And, and the, the fact is we really can start from the customer to develop services which are meant to be digital. Um, yeah, I think when I, when I think about digital, as I said, when we started R&D Direct 20 years ago, the whole aim was to be at that time still online Huh, what we now, now it's digital, but to do it without branches, to do it without physical touch points. And that's still what we are about. So everything is already digital, as it used to be online um, in the past. And we even have an inside joke, huh? so STP, straight to processing or straight to printer. Huh? So if you do digitizing, then you have your client sent in a PDF, but you print it and you type it over. For the client, it might be the same experience, um, but it's really different uh, in the back office. But if you talk about client experiences, I think client expectations are not set inside the banking industry. For us, the next wave of competitors is not another bank, because what you want as a client is what Google offers you, or Uber, or Amazon. It's not what another bank offers you. So for us, the standard is outside there. And to get there and to really understand what the need of clients is, you have to move away from thinking like a bank. And therefore, I think the title of the forum um, should be different. It should be from bank to digital. Because if you think that you're going to be a digital bank, you still think like a bank. But you have to think digital. You have to think customer. You have to move away from product thinking. People don't want a mortgage. People want a nice house to live in. And they happen to need a mortgage in order to achieve that. But if you organize yourself around mortgages, you're never really going to get a real customer experience. You have to organize yourself around that need of a customer, of a client, for a nice house. And then you become really client-oriented. And that's more than digital. Digital is a way to get there. But it's really thinking about what the client wants and drive that. I like that a lot. That's, I, know, I know it's been said a lot, oh, people don't want houses, they want a mortgage. But you've got to think, how can we deliver houses as opposed to mortgages? Um, Brett, your views on digital versus digitized? Yeah, there, there is, uh, um, there, there's probably no digital bank in the world because um, to become a truly digital bank, as you're arguing, you can no longer be a bank. Um, so to, to illustrate the best company in the world at doing banking type activities in the digital realm is today is Ant Financial, about to probably IPO at 200 billion plus in terms of valuation. Um, and so if you look at, they, they have the, uh, the the most successful deposit product on the planet. They have, they're they in 100 countries with 1.2 billion users across a mobile bank accounts or mobile wallets uh, today. Um, they have a, a phenomenal credit business. So in terms of banking utility in the digital frame, Ant Financial is the world's best example of a digital company providing financial services and if you look at their org structure they don't have any they don't have a mortgage department you know they don't have a, a credit card department they have none of those artifacts of a traditional bank from an organization structure or KPIs their entire board is made up of technologists their entire executive uh, committee is made up of technologists you go to the best banks in the world that are doing digital activities they still have tons of bankers on the board they still have tons of traditional bankers in the org chart. And so you, you, you couldn't call yourself 
a, a digital company doing banking or a digital bank unless all of the artifacts organizationally of traditional banks had disappeared. And so that's, that's true digitization. Um, and so when you see organizations that are trying to become tech companies in the banking space, DBS Bank, uh, BBVA and others, they are, you can see them on that transition where now you've got technologists on the board, you've got people talking about technology in the organization, but they're, they're nowhere near close to somewhere like Ant Financial in terms of the way they're organized and structured. Go on there, Alice. Yeah. No, but uh, I was thinking that regulation, as you know, forced us to have bankers in the board to follow rules that are very um, strict uh, in the way you do banking. So what you describe is pretty difficult with the regulation. Well, it depends on the regulator. Like the Chinese regulator obviously allows it because you now have Ant Financial um, doing everything that traditional banks do. But a better example in China would probably be WeBank. Um, China is, uh, WeBank is the largest um, uh, uh, challenger bank in the world now, 180 million customers, um, and they do that. Uh, obviously, they have some banking talent in the organization, but um, none of the executives are traditional bankers alone. You know, the, everyone that's in that organization structure is dominantly technical, first, primarily, and secondly, banking. So that's, that's the difference. Um, I think it's in the middle. You need really innovative people, technology people. I recruit more engineers than bankers today, and I need them. But you also need bankers. And WeBank is an interesting example because it's one of our partners. And one of the things we provide is banking knowledge. Um, so there you see, we get an innovation drive from them, we get technology insights, but you need, uh, as Ali said, you need bankers as well. And it's not just for regulation, it's also to understand how risk conversion works. Huh? You get savings from one person, you want to lend to another person, you fully need to understand, th well, your pipeline risk, for instance. The same with payments. But the big question is, uh, how you bring it together, because if you look at the future trends, then there will always be a need for banking services, but not necessarily for the traditional bank. Uh, we all move to platforms, so the question is how you can combine your platform services, uh, close to the customer, with your banking knowledge, can you actually decouple them? And I think that is the big question in the financial industry today, and where does regulation take place? The front end, the middle office, or even at the back end? And if you look at what we are doing today, we're trying also in certain places right, to be a bank without a balance sheet. And then you go to advice, then you go to services. Um, but it's still a way eh, to get there. But if you look at what as a customer you do, you look at your screen all day, you don't want to be bothered with you know, your financial updates. You want to do fun stuff, you want to do your social media. So how as a bank or as a financial service provider or as a digital company, how do I make you actually go into your own financial situation and become aware of what you need to do as a client? Because you need to be aware of the savings rate and your investment portfolio and your pensions because you need to prepare for the future. And that's the big question today, how to still engage clients into their own financial future. And as a provider, where do you play? Are you going to play as a platform at the front end, the middle end or the back end? Maybe just to come back to La Banque Postale, um, when they decided to launch this digital bank, uh, which was not even called my French bank at that time, they decided to recruit me. I'm not a banker from the very beginning. I come from the telco industry, but my deputy CIO is a, a traditional banker. So we, we combined those two experiences to build this new bank. Let's look at how we can get there because Google is coming, Chinese, big, the big tech is coming, big tech is coming, and you don't want to end up stuck on a platform that's 40, 50 years old. So how can a, physically, how can a bank become, become digital? Um, is, is anybody in the room from TSB? Thank God for that, right. Obviously TSB, absolute cluster of things that went wrong. So how can you, as a big traditional bank, 
become digital physically? Do you go down the sort of speedboat route, or do you do a, do you attempt a kind of big bang migration? How do you kind of move your platform across when it comes to core replacements? Um, I think what we're doing at ING is, is both. We are already digital huh, in many countries. So we move from online to digital, which is a smaller step than from physical to digital. Um, but we're also building cross-country platforms. And one of them is for the French market, um, combined with the Spanish, the Italian, and the Czech market. It's called Maggie, or Model Bank, we call it. And we're there, there building a platform to serve multiple European countries digitally. And we use the lessons learned from the different countries to build the best bank, the best aggregation layer um, of tomorrow. And we've been on it now for a year and a half, I think. Um, so it takes time, um, but we're doing it. We're building that platform. We still have to roll it out. Do you think that um, that kind of... And by the way, my best engineers are on it. Eh? So that's something we haven't touched yet. If you want to become digital, if you want to innovate yourself, you have to be ready to hurt yourself a little bit and say, okay, I'm going to send my best people to do this new innovative thing. I'm going to kill my old uh, way of working um, to favor that new way of working and, and get that out of the door. So to compete with the likes of Ant Financial, do you think that's the, the most effective approach, kind of, again, piece, piece by piece that you're doing at ING? Uh, I think the big question there is more um, of one single European market. So if we would do this in the US, we would suddenly have you know, a big market or in China, and that's a bit the drawback of being in Europe, where we still don't have a full single market. The regulation in France is different from the Netherlands, it's different from Germany. So that is holding us back. It's not so much uh, whether we can do it or not. If we would do it in the US, immediately we would have a large market. Um, Alice, obviously, my French bank, you are... Actually, we're in France, and up to now, we remain in France. Uh, so the approach may be pretty different. Um, the, the, really cr the question is for a traditional bank is, how do you foster innovation, change your culture? And it's pretty difficult. And, and again, if I take the example, what I know, the example of La Banque Postale, uh, they decided to create last year uh, and in, uh, started an incubator called Platform 58, which is there today, so you can, you can go downstairs and meet them. Uh, the, the, the intention was really to play an active role um, in the fintech ecosystem in France and, and foster innovation in France with French fintechs and also to help the teams of La Banque Postale uh, think a different way uh, find that different methods to innovate and to serve customers can be developed and foster also uh, cooperation between those fintechs and La Banque Postale. Um, again, it's a way, uh, it's an approach which is pretty based in France, but we, we leverage our um, full potential. Because the, the way that, that you're you're, you're a speedboat. I think that's, that's such a cool way of doing it, where you can almost be ring-fenced. You know, La Banque Postale can try lots of quite risky, in some cases, the things that they couldn't try across the whole group and then spring them across. Yeah, exactly. And La French Bank has also a role for La Banque Postale to be a pilot and to develop, experiment, innovate. And they ask us to then uh, be able to have this innovation feedback loop to help uh, the teams of La Banque Postale to evolve. Absolutely. I breath. So, you know, at the end of this decade, 2030, when we look back, we'll see three sets of players delivering financial services through a tech, predominantly through a technology layer. There'll be traditional banks who've become digitized in some form. You'll have uh, fintech specialists who have developed key technologies uh, and got rid of a ton of friction, you know, including unicorns and challenger banks and big brands that stand on their own against uh, traditional players, and tech giants who become the gatekeepers of the um, technologies that deliver financial services day to day. And so if you think about, you know, obviously fintechs and techs are dominantly tech, so then how does a, a, a bank survive in that ecosystem of the future? And it's their ability to work with those players in that ecosystem is essential. 
So um, if you're a standalone bank and you think we're going to do it all ourselves, then you're really missing the point of the changes that are happening here. But if you say, you know, how do we partner with these technology firms to further our progress, be more uh, collaborative? Um, you know, the, the, I think one of the easiest ways to assess a bank's true willingness to digitize is where they say, oh, well, there's a fintech that could do that. Let's, let's uh, bring them into the, the, um, the fold instead of going, well, let's try and copy what that fintech do, do, do and, and build it ourselves. Because, tr you know, if you look at, say, Bo in, um, you know, the, the UK, you know, compared with the challenges, um, Bo has arguably, you know, not produced significant innovation of the market. They're following on from the challenges in the UK. But the more critical element of that is it took them five times as long and cost them 20 times as much as Monzo to launch basically the same. And so you have to look at that and say, why would you do that instead of um, you know, partnering with someone who's actually better at producing that innovation than you are? Yeah, ING's got to get in there because you guys yeah. partner like no business. <laughs> yeah, no, the, so we, we, we have now 190 partnerships. Um, we also closed more than 50. So fail fast. That's very important as well because if you go uh, for a lot of those cooperation opportunities, you also have to be able to decide if it's not working. If it's not working, you stop it. Um, but what I see happening uh, here in France um, is that it really we need fintechs as a bank, but the fintechs needs us as well. Huh? If you want to roll out your great innovation or your sweet spot in the client experience, and often I'm jealous huh? when I see a fintech, I'm like, ah, we should have done it. But that's where we partner with the fintech. But the fintech needs our client base, our regulation, um, to roll it actually out and make it happen across uh, different countries. And what we did in France here, for instance, we started an instant loan uh, platform for SMEs. We did it with five fintechs. And indeed, it took us uh, well less than a year to build. But it went very fast with the different fintechs. But to get the different fintechs to cooperate, not just with us, but with each other, that was also a challenge. It but is, I confirm. And, and that comes back to culture, right? So if you look at organizations that are, you know, have a chance of surviving the sort of disruption of fintech and tech giants, it, it really does start with culture. You know, if you have a CEO that is, you know, like uh, Piyush Gupta or uh, Carlos at BBVA that says, you know, we've got to pursue technology, ING is the same, we've got to pursue technology to transform this organization. We don't even know what the end game is yet, but we need to learn as much and absorb as much of this skill as we can. So culturally, the organization is built to say, you know, just, just, you know, keep going and suck up whatever technology innovation you can. Whereas, you, you know, where you've got incumbents who are arguing that, oh, well, the branch network is still an essential part of our business and things like that, that culture is not going to get you there, right, if you're, if you're looking in the rear review, rear view mirror. But there's something interesting about a branch network, what it does offer. Because we've been on this digital journey now for huh, 20 years, but what we have learned um, over the past years is, of course, clients still need, or at big moments in their life, they need live contact. So when we do data, when we do personalization, we're far more personal than we were a couple of years ago. But the client needs, when there is a big decision to make, needs personal contact. So we have a call center, of course, but about a year ago we started video calls. And we can see that works much better because that actually you can see Huh, the call center agent as a client, so the conversations are longer, um, the, what people bring in investments is more, but especially the satisfaction of the client is much, much higher because they see the person they're talking to. And that we should always be able to provide whatever way that live contact at important moments. On that note there, I know, Brett, I know you're a massive fan of branches, so um, I, I never use cash, I never use branches. My grand does. And a friend of mine runs a restaurant chain, and he is constantly having to use cash from tips, cash all the time. So you also have to look at your customer and whether or not they need, they need a digital bank or whether they still need that multitude of uh, physical presence. Um, obviously, La Banque Postale has got quite a, a large physical network. Do you find, um, uh, my French Bank, you, you're able to partner quite effectively there? Actually, uh, when you open an account at my French Bank, you can do it both ways, either uh, at the post office, and it takes you only 10 minutes, 
and the, the post officer has a small device which looks like your smartphone and it does it with you, which is very helpful. What you're saying is very true and not always uh, at important moment, but also when things are difficult and, and to scan your ID and so on, it may be difficult for some of the customers, which doesn't mean that they won't be able to follow their account on their mobile. They will be able to do everything on their mobile, but onboarding may be difficult. So we help them at this difficult phase. Of course, they can also do it digitally, uh, by themselves, on their mobile or on their laptop. So we welcome them at the post office. And secondly, we've got a call center based in Lille, in France, uh, which is there to help them. So it's, it's a human contact, not physical, but a human contact. And we're pretty sure that this human presence gives reassurance to the customer. It's, it's essential for us. And since we are La Banque Postale and we have this strong presence and strong confidence, we had to be there to help customers with a strong customer care. It, it was an obligation for us. The, the problem, you know, we could obviously descend into a discussion about branches um, here, um, but just very briefly, the key problem branches have in a digital world is the economics don't work. It's expensive. Because, you know, you, you have, for those couple of instances where a human contact is going to be beneficial, the business case for a branch don't hold up. There's just not enough traction. There's not enough footfall in the branch to make them economically viable. And so here's the key problem you get if you're a bank trying to digitize and you've got this incumbent behavior, you know, customers who are used to your branch network, moving them off that to a predominantly digital framework of customer service is a, is a real challenge. Challenges don't have that issue. Challenger banks don't need branches to do, you know, all of the day-to-day -day banking that they provide now, and they, they are not going to need to deploy branches to be competitive. And so, um, you know, the, the argument over do you need branches to service customers has largely been solved. You know, the reality is there's 150 challenger banks around the world, and none of them onboard customers in a branch. And what we've learned from that is that produces a dramatically different cost of acquisition one fiftieth of the cost of acquiring a customer in a bank branch. And so if you want to scale up a financial services organization in the digital world, you wouldn't do it with face-to-face -face interactions that require a wet signature. It just doesn't scale fast enough, and VCs will never invest in banks with branches. Yes, but the advantage of La Poste and La Banque Postale is that those point of sales are not that's, dedicated to banks. If there's an existing physical banks. network you can co-opt, then I, I think that's fine. But uh, you, a, again, i just be very clear. In the last 10 years of fintech um, growth that we've seen, you've never seen a single VC invest in branch networks. And they don't do that because the economics don't work at scale. But to your point, Alice, I think like Starling yeah, Bank. Post offices in the UK. are not dedicated to banking, yeah. which is an advantage. Yeah, you, I say you can co opt it, right? Exactly the same They're as Starling Bank. In the they UK. do post, actually. Again, I think the, the truth is in the middle. Uh, <laughs> so. I'm glad you're sitting there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm the bridge here, yeah. <laughs> So, um, we are a digital bank, we don't have branches here in France, we do have branches in our old home markets, the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, and what we see also there is branches, people hardly go there anymore. Um, but like with our video calls here, there is something huh, about the live human contact. And you don't need branches to do that, but I see there's a customer need to have live contact at certain moments in their life. But what I found personally a far more intriguing question, and it goes a little bit back to what you both said, is I live in a digital world. I'm a digital Navy. But how can I provide something digital, whether it's a bank or something else, that's also appealing to my mother-in-law? Because not everybody is as digital as we all are. Not everybody is as savvy with their phone or do, does understand new technology. So how do we make new technology accessible to all? And I think that is for us, Huh? as citizens of this world or of this country, a question to think about. Because we want to provide digital services, a digital bank, digital whatever, to not just the happy few who are digitalized, but to everybody, including my mother-in-law. That's exactly what we want. Well, that actually brings us to the, the sort of final area I want to touch on, which is, which is the customer. Because 
My father sent me about a year ago saying, uh, sent me a, a Daily Mail link saying, have you heard of this new thing called Bitcoin? I think it's going to be quite, quite interesting. And I was like, that's, that's incredible. You haven't heard of this. And you know, it was it's 2019. Um, so when it comes to the customer, is a customer even aware if you're a digital bank or not, if they're, if they're using an app? Are they even aware if you're a truly sort of digital app? So let's, let's, let's look at the kind of customer point. I think the customer is aware. I think they now expect any bank or any large corporation to have a well-working app. Huh? And we like to provide, of course, the highest standard, but people expect um, something in the middle there to already work. And not just for a bank. It's the same whether you do a hotel, whether you do online sales, whether you're a travel agency. If it's not working anymore, then basically your customers easily tune out. They also expect what we traditionally call omni-channel service. So when you go into the app and then you go to the call center or in an existing shop, you expect to that people know what you're doing as a customer. Um, but what is far more intriguing is actually what the customer is going to expect two years down the road, because that's the thing we need to build today. It's not the standard of today that we have to look at, it's the standard for tomorrow that we have to start to build, provide, think about design. And especially in payments, I think we're going to leapfrog again a couple of times in the next years to come. And, and I think that's why if, if you look at customer expectations, you know, if you as a bank are basing your CX trying to copy what, a, you know, a challenger bank is doing, for example, you're missing the point because customer expectations aren't set by what challenger banks are delivered. They're set by the day-to-day -day use of technology by Uber, Uber Eats, Amazon, Alibaba, and stuff like this. So um, it's it's not about being the best digital bank in the world. It's being, it's a fact that if you look at the service layer, um, if you look at the way brands are built today, they're built at scale, they're built on digital distribution mechanisms and optimizing customer experiences for whatever it is you're trying to do. And so when it comes to banking, you know, the, the dominant, um, you know, driver behind, you know, digitization of banks is lowering friction. Um, and that's being pushed upon us by other, other industries where CX has improved dramatically through technology use. Yeah, I think that customers want simplicity, transparency, easy access, less procedures. That is what they want, whatever the service. So it's not a question of type of customers, age or whatever. It's really common sense. Brilliant. Excellent, excellent. Cool. Right, guys. Um, last little final thoughts. How can we go from being a bank of 2020 to a bank of 2030? How can we go to be a truly digital bank and kind of, sort of final, uh, final thoughts? Uh, Karim, we'll start with. Um, well, first of all, we go from bank to digital. We don't go from yeah. bank to digital bank. I think that's a very important distinction. Um, secondly, we really have to think through what it is that the customer wants um, and then choose where we want to play as a company. Do we want to be that platform and provide the services close to the customer, understand fully the customer needs, organize around that? Or do we want to provide the expertise, the middleware, the regulation, the hardcore technology? Um, and there's also a play eh, for KYC as a service for multi-bank uh, offerings, but that's in the middle. For me personally, I think the most interesting place to play is close to the customer, but that's who I am. But there are many people who want to provide maybe those middle eh, office services. I think the whole back office is going to be far further automated. Um, but there will be a big... Um, both, I think, a breakup and a consolidation in the banking world because those large techs will uh, move into banking services very fast now. Um, fintechs roll out. Um, and if you're honest, if you look at traditional banks, almost all the traditional banks um, trade uh, below book value uh, on the stock exchange. So we need to change something. If we want to get better at it, if we want to get VCs or individual investors to invest in us, uh, we need to get better at what we're doing because... The current evaluations is not going to get us to 10 years uh, still being a traditional bank. We need to fully innovate ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, Brett, final thoughts on becoming bank to digital? 
So the, the biggest shift is um, not really uh, just around digitization, but organizationally, it's around your structure. So you're moving from a product-oriented world to an experience-oriented world. So customers, obviously, are the driver of those experiences. So and you use the example of mortgages later, earlier, rather. Um, you know, in, in the world of the future, you won't sell mortgages. You'll enable someone to buy a home. And so in that world, you know, what interest rate you have on your mortgage Mortgage, what features you have on the mortgage product, none of that is important because the single point of data that's going to make you successful in enabling a mortgage business in the future is knowing the intent of someone to buy a home. That's going to be far more effective than any product feature you have. So I'd say dominantly it's moving from a product fo focus to experience focused org structure. Um, much has been said. Um, I think we, we don't know how it will evolve. Uh, the world of banking has evolved significantly in the past years. And uh, what I'm sure of is being digital uh, position us in a much better way than, than not. <laughs> and if you want to deliver the services you were described in the future, you have to know your customer, get the right data, be able to use them, be able to customize your services to, to answer their needs. Excellent, excellent. Um, also going down to culture. Um, that's the other thing. If you change that at the top, then it all filters down. We've got time for probably one or two questions from the audience. Um, audience members, does anyone have any questions? In that case, I've got to come back with you on one other thing, Brett. Bank of Ireland. Bank of Ireland's branch network. They are aiming to compete with WeWork as uh, for their SMEs, so all the SMEs can use their branches. Way to kind of monetize the branch network, maybe? That's, that's a problem looking for a solution. That's saying, we've got all this real estate we used to use as bank branches. No one's using them as bank branches now, so what do we do with this real estate to keep it open? I, you know, that's... I, I don't think that's... Now, it might work. You know, I mean, um, Capital One in the US has all these cafes um, that they've produced. They're not particularly great at coffee, and they're, they're reasonably good at banking, but, you know, it's sort of like as they've transitioned. The, this comes back to, you know, what do you need? The, what's the role of the bank trying to do? And to your point, it's really about providing people with that level of comfort at certain key points in their life. So the real question is, how do you deliver a solution to that problem that's economically viable? And I think the use of video and artificial intelligence and all of those things will go a long way to doing that. Absolutely, like with the video calls. Yeah, and maybe maybe one remark about real estate. Um, we have just opened a new head office in Amsterdam, and we opened it uh, to fintechs, to startups, to share our workspace. And that's one of the most inspiring experiences I've had, working there for one day or two days. I'm in France, so I'm not there that often. But you're actually sitting there and you're surrounded by independents, by uh, startups, by fintechs. And that atmosphere that that creates, that's very inspiring and that gives us a lot of drive forward to do things differently. And at my French Bank, we, we share a same building with the incubator platform, which, which was very, very useful for the teams to meet, share, discuss, help with each other. Culture, exactly. Cool. Awesome. Thank you uh, very much, guys. Can we have a big round of applause for our panelists?